how many of you were alive during the Korean War? What do you remember about the Korean War? How many of you remember why the war started? Yeah, that's right. So my presentation might actually challenge that narrative a little bit. Um, so let's get started. You may know that uh, 1910, from 1910 to 1945, um, Korea was colonized by Japan. And then in 1945, at the end of World War II, as you know, Japan surrendered. And then the Allied forces, basically the United States and the Soviet Union, uh, they were discussing what to do with the various territories and the question of Korea, what happens to Korea. And two young uh, US Army officers basically took out a National Geographic map of Korea. And they looked at it, and they drew a line across the 38th parallel. And they said, that looks pretty good. Let's just divide it up like that. And they suggested it to the Soviets. So you take the north, we'll take the south. And, and Stalin basically said, OK, that sounds good. There was no consultation with any Korean. Uh, and that's basically how the line was drawn. The Soviets did uh, march into the north, and the United States went to the south. And at that time, the United States, was, uh, its main interest in that area of the world was uh, it, they wanted to stop the spread of communism in Asia. Uh, so they wanted a presence on the Korean Peninsula. When the Americans came, the Koreans thought, this is great. The Americans are finally coming, and they're going to liberate us from the Japanese. They thought the Americans believe in freedom and democracy and independence. So when they finally come, we're going to have an independent and free uh, country. Instead, what happened was that the Americans came, and they basically reinstalled the same Korean people who had served under the Japanese colonial government. So as you can see from this slide, the Japanese flag came down, the American flag went up, but nothing else changed. Everything stayed the same. The Americans, they uh, created the South Korean constabulary. And these guys were all, all the commanders were composed of Japanese trained ex-officers. And the Americans preferred these guys over the Korean soldiers who had fought in the Liberation Army because these guys were much more obedient. And these guys, because they were trained by the Japanese, they naturally inherited all of the um, traditions of the Imperial Army, whose mission was basically to put down Korean rebels, right? Then in 1948, the US military government so at that time, all Koreans, both in the North and the South, they were all preparing for an independent country, independent government. And everyone imagined this to be a unified, one single government uh, over the entire Korean Peninsula. But what happened was the United States actually enforced a separate election in the South. This was protested by many Koreans in both the North and the South. And actually, um, as Bruce, I'm sure, can talk about, is in, in Jeju Island in 1948, there was a, 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 intent, a grave massacre, tens of thousands of people who were protesting against the separate election because everybody wanted a unified government. And if you have a separate election in the South, that would basically cement the division. So when people were protesting this, um, many of them were brutally put down. Um, and then the United States installed this man, uh, Sung Man Ri, who was a, a man who was educated in the United States uh, as the leader of the South. He was basically a puppet leader. And this is right before his inauguration. He is standing next to General MacArthur in the middle. And then on the left side is uh, General Haj who was the uh, leader of the US military government in, in the South. These guys, they carried out a very systematic 
and protracted uh, counter-revolutionary violence. Uh, and their goal was to decimate so-called insurgents who they branded as communists or communist sympathizers. In actuality, most of these guys may not have ever heard of Marx or Lenin. They were basically fighting for their national independence. But because they were fighting for independence, uh, they were branded as communists and many, many of them were either jailed or, or executed. Even before the war started in 1950, between 45 and 1950, a conservative estimate of 100,000 people were killed uh, by security forces that were installed and directed by the United States. So, speak up? Okay. So that was the origin of the Korean War. So, um, you know, many of us, even myself, people in South Korea as well as the United States, we grew up learning that the Americans came because the communists were bad and they invaded the South. The Americans came to defend freedom and democracy and protect the South Koreans, right? Um, but that, you know, depends on whose per perspective you're looking at the situation from. For the majority of the Koreans at that time, the war was actually an extension of a very brutal campaign to eliminate and pacify people who were fighting for uh, an independent and unified government. And then uh, right after the war started, um, the war started in, at the end of June 1950, um, a few weeks later, um, there was um, an incident um, at a railroad tract in a village called Nogunni. Um, so many uh, Koreans uh, were told to evacuate because the war has started and you cannot stay here anymore. So uh, many were um, fleeing south. Um, and there was a group of people who had come to the railroad tracks uh, in this village, um, many of them mothers and children. And they came across a roadblock, a checkpoint, where US soldiers um, stopped them at gunpoint. And they wanted to, to check, search everyone to see if anyone was carrying weapons, if they were part of the rebel forces. Um, they didn't find anything, but they still um, radioed um, uh, Air Force um, and uh, ordered um, um, them to drop bombs and uh, also um, use machine gun fire. And about 100 people uh, were actually shot down. Um, but there were a few, several uh, other 100 people who actually were able to escape. And what they did is they fled the tracks and they went under into those two tunnels there. So about 300 people were trapped uh, in these tunnels. And for the next four days, uh, the Air Force basically um, uh, uh, shot machine gun fire into the tunnels from both ends. Um, and most, the majority of the people uh, uh, died. And, and I think the, the, the um, most accurate estimate that we have by the South Korean government is 300 people um, who died inside the tunnels. Um, in, at the turn of 1950, so what happened? In June 1950 was that the North did invade the South and they were actually able to push all the way down to the southern tip of South Korea. And then the US sent troops. They landed in Incheon in September and they were able to push all the way back up uh, to the tip of North Korea. And then in uh, 1951, in January, the Chinese entered and they pushed way back down again. Um, and uh, in January of 1951, when the Chinese entered in a surprise attack, the US and South Korean forces, they panicked. Uh, they were not uh, expecting this to happen. And so then the US policy at that time was to torch and burn everything uh, in sight as they, as they retreated uh, below the 38th parallel. So they had uh, what's called a scorch earth policy. And then, uh, also, for three years, the U.S. carried out intense uh, bombing campaign. Um, and a U.S. general 
uh, who testified at that time at a Senate hearing basically said there is nothing left standing. There are no more targets in Korea. And Curtis LeMay, who was the head of the Air Force during that time, he said, we burned down every town in the North and the South. We killed off 20% of the Korean population. So this was the kind of brutality that happened during the war. But for decades after the war in the South, we had a series of military dictatorships. And nobody dared speak out about what they experienced and survived during the war. So none of this was documented or uncovered. People just um, you know, uh, held it you know, in, in hushed um, secret conversations among family members or, or neighbors. But uh, uh, no one dared speak out about this officially. Not until 50 years later, uh, in the mid-2000s, when there was a liberal government under President No Moo Hyun, he actually established uh, what was called the Korea Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And they were charged with finally uncovering all of the civilian massacres that happened uh, during the Korean War. And they began this, um, this um, project. And according to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, there were 215 cases of civilian massacres that were committed by US soldiers. But so far, the only incident that was investigated and documented was this, uh, the Nogunni incident. Um, the Truth and Recon Reconciliation Commission, Commission, they actually recommended a, a nationwide investigation. Uh, however, that never happened because then right after, from 2008 until last year, we had two very conservative governments in power in South Korea. And the first thing that they did was to shut down the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. So that investigation did not resume. So even to this day, we have no idea the exact number of the deaths uh, and the details that are linked to uh, the US Army uh, during the Korean War. Um, the war in 1953 ended in an armistice, uh, which is a temporary ceasefire, not a permanent set settlement of the war. Um, do you know who signed the armistice? Which countries? The US, the US yep. So, nope. No. China. China, yep. And North Korea. So those three countries signed the armistice. Who is significantly missing? South Korea. South Korea didn't sign this armistice because the US basically signed on their behalf. Um, and within the armistice, uh, it says, within three months of signing this, we will have a conference to permanently settle the war and withdraw all foreign troops. To this day, that conference has not happened. Um, so now, as you know, the U.S. still has 28,500 troops there. Um, and um, the U.S. has what's called wartime operational control, which means that if the war breaks out in South Korea, uh, the U a U.S. commander will uh, command South Korean troops. In essence, for the f past 70 years, South Korea has basically been not a fully sovereign country. Um, it has been, uh, some people would call it a satellite country of the United States. And many people say to me, well, wasn't the Korean War between the North and the South? So it should be settled between those two parties. And what I always say to people is actually no. The Korean War, which is still ongoing, is between the United States and North Korea. North Korea and South Korea are divided. So the task that needs to be done between those parties is to reconcile and reunify. North Korea and the United States are at war. So the task that needs to be done there is permanently settle the war, which means turn the armistice into a peace treaty. So the, the first thing between North and South Korea, the process of reconciliation and reunification is happening now. However, 
The second thing, settling the war between the North Korea and the U.S. Is, is, is what's not happening right now. So let's talk about the first thing. This year we have seen dramatic shifts in inter-Korean relations. Um, I don't know if... It's too bad the red text... <laughs> I made it red so that it would stand out more, but actually <laughs> you cannot see it very well. But anyway... Um, this year in September, the North and South Korean leaders met for the third time this year, and they signed a very comprehensive military agreement. This is very exciting. So some of the things that this agreement says is that they will completely seize all hostile acts in, in land, air, and sea. They will stop all military exercises uh, effective November 1. Uh, there will be a no-fly zone above the military demarcation line that divides north and south, effective November 1. And they're going to create, turn the DMZ into a peace zone. So what is this? This is, in essence, a declaration to end the war between the north and south. Oh, Mary Beth is getting so emotional. <laughs> You're going to make me cry. Yeah, this is, this is very uh, dramatic uh, for the Koreans. Um, and then... The same summit, that's President Moon Jae-in right there standing up. He is standing up in front of 100,000 North Koreans. And what does he say in front of them? He says, our nation must live together. We are going to work together, bring the 80 million Korean people uh, to build a new nation. So this is a commitment uh, towards reunification. Um, most, uh, you know, a lot, most of what is happening between the North and South is not covered very much in the U.S. media at all, but so many dramatic things have happened this year. So starting with the left-hand upper, left-hand side corner, so there are unified sports teams now. They are competing together in international competitions. So, of course, we saw that in the Olympics. They, you know, enter together on, under the unification flag. But in the recent ASEAN Games, too, the women's ping pong, uh, team uh, was a unified North and South Korean team and they did really well and it, it was covered live uh, in both North and South Korea and everybody was very excited about it. Um, they're like superstars back home. Um, in the left-hand bottom corner there were um, friendly soccer matches between um, trade unions uh, uh, of North and South Korea uh, back in August. Um, the two Koreas, they want to connect their railways uh, together. Um, and then, of course, that's uh, at the bottom right is the, a picture of the two leaders at the top of Mount Baekdu in North Korea holding their hands together. Um, these are dramatic things that, that none, none of us imagined was possible even a year ago. Um, so this is... Uh, this is amazing that this now also the two Koreas have a 24-7 uh, hotline between the two leaders so they can pick up their phone anytime and communicate with each other. There is also a hotline office at the DMZ. Um, so their role is to communicate at any time so that they can reduce any military tension. And then also they facilitate civilian engagement. Um, and there have been many delegations back and forth, civilian delegations from the South going to North Korea, K-pop stars who are performing uh, in North Korea, and then North Korean cultural troops coming to the South and doing concerts. Um, yeah, this is, this is uh, amazing. Um, dramatic events. This, of course, didn't just happen out of the blue. There is a history to this. The first summit that happened between the North and South, this was back in 2000 between uh, former President Kim Dae-jung um, and also uh, who received a Nobel Peace Prize for this, um, and then uh, former North Korean leader Kim Jong-il. And uh, when they met, they signed the historic June 15 declaration. June 15 is a very significant date for many Koreans, so there are many references to June 15, so if you hear it, you will know what they're talking about. It's talking about the very first summit between the North and South. When they came together, they signed the declaration that basically said, we agreed to resolve the question of reunification independently uh, among ourselves, so meaning without any foreign intervention. 
Um, and then the next South Korean leader, No Mu Hyun, also met with Kim Jong Il. This was back in 2007. Uh, they sound, signed another declaration. It's called the October 4th Declaration. Um, and they, again, in the first paragraph of the declaration, uh, we resolve the issue of unification uh, on our own initiative. So this, is, this kind of language is in the first paragraph of the very first declaration in 2000, the second one in 2007, and then the one signed this year, uh, 2018, uh, the Pyongyang Declaration. Uh, we will move towards unification of our own initiative. Um, however, what happened right after this? Unfortunately, we had a lost decade between 2008 and 2017. We had two very conservative administrations in South Korea. Uh, Lee Myung-bak is the man on the left, um, and Park Geun-hye was the woman on, on the right. They both uh, were very um, hawkish towards uh, North Korea, um, and so they uh, shut down all um, engagement uh, and any kind of dialogue. So for 10 years, uh, there was no engagement or dialogue between the North and South. Right now, both of them are sitting in jail on, uh, because they were <laughs> tried for corruption. Um, what happened in, those dates are wrong, it should say 2016 to 2017. What happened in South Korea was there were mass protests. We refer to them as the candlelight protests. Millions of people came out onto the street every weekend in very cold winter months uh, to basically say we have had enough of these governments. We don't want Park Geun-hye anymore, impeach her. Um, they were dissatisfied with many of her policies, not just her policy towards North Korea, but also her labor policies. She was very anti-labor uh, union. She was cracking, cracking down on, on uh, labor union activists. And actually, the president of the, the Confederation of Trade Unions was, was in jail for many years uh, for organizing such protests. Um, and uh, she wanted to... Uh, introduce a government-authored history textbook. Um, uh, they would own, own, the public high schools would only teach uh, one version of history that is authored by the government. Um, these kinds of policies were opposed by many different sectors of society, obviously students, teachers, um, labor unions. And, and then, then at the end, it was just the housewives and white collar workers and everyone who came out onto the streets and said, we've had enough. We don't want any of these policies anymore. So Park Geun-hye was finally impeached. Uh, and then now we have a new president, a man by the name of Moon Jae-in, um, who is now uh, spearheading uh, the inter-Korean uh, process of reconciliation. And there is widespread support for his policies among Koreans everywhere, definitely in the South, but also in the diaspora among Korean Americans. There is great excitement for what he is doing. So the graph that you see there is um, his approval rating in South Korea uh, uh, in his first year. So uh, starting in May of 2017, when he entered office, uh, he's, he entered with 84% approval which is like historic uh, among South Korean presidents. It started to come down a little bit. And then in May of 2018, right after the Pyongyang summit, it shot back up to 77%. So everybody is applauding his inter-Korean policy. Um, and then if you, and there was a recent poll taken uh, just this month, um, and they asked, people about his performance in many different sectors, the economy, his foreign policy, et cetera. His approval rating has come down a little bit because of his domestic policies. People don't support his, you know, he's not doing enough to create jobs, and he is not supporting the labor unions, et cetera. However, on his inter-Korean policy, uh, there is 64. 5.9% approval, and people who disapprove are only 2.8%. So many are still very excited about um, uh, the inter-Korean uh, process of dialogue that is happening. 
the key missing party is Washington. You know, the, uh, you know as I said, the key party uh, to the Korean War uh, was Washington, and also the U.S. was a party to the 1953 armistice. So the United States also needs to come to the table and permanently settle the war uh, between uh, North Korea and the United States. Now, there is, you know, Trump has said, sure, I will do this, but there is much resistance to this, uh, not only in his own administration, but in both parties and in, in many people, think tanks in, 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 in Washington. Um, why is the United States so reluctant to end the Korean War? Unfortunately, the reason is perfectly encapsulated in the comments of someone who is a Korean American. You may have seen her on CNN. She is an ex-CIA officer, now a fellow at CSIS. And she says, no, we cannot have a peace treaty because, and that should come at the, if we do sign a peace treaty, that should be at the very end of this process after North Korea gives up their nuclear weapons. You know why? Because it undermines the justification of our troops staying in South Korea. <laughs> so she is saying this very publicly. You know, if, if there's no more war, our troops can't stay there anymore. And that's a bad thing for the United States. And this comment is echoed by the commander of the UN command. He says, what would an end of war declaration mean? Uh, people would start to question the presence and the continued existence of the UN command. And if that happens, then it's a slippery slope to people questioning the presence of US troops on the peninsula. So Washington is getting very nervous, right? If we end the war, this means that we have to pull troops. And this is not something that we want. Why does Washington not want to pull troops from Korea? Well, one answer might be uh, reflected in this man's co comments. Um, he is the commandant of the U.S. Marine Corps, and uh, this was a recent comment. He was at some breakfast, and he was um, interviewed by a reporter. And he said, you know, Korea is just an ideal place to train our soldiers because it's hot in the summer, the hills are steep, blah, 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 blah. And, you know, if, if we can't exercise anymore in Korea, where are we going to go? He's complaining about this. You know, we have no, where are we going to go to practice? <laughs> so that's one uh, answer. Uh, but I think the more, probably the more significant answer might be here. What is the one commodity where we can pour trillions of dollars into producing and never run out of effective demand? Yeah. So as long as we are at perpetual war, there will always be a demand for weapons, right? And so the Pentagon and the Armed Services Committees of both the House and the Senate, and then also the weapons lobby that basically controls the corporate media, all of them try to convince the American public, right? Our security is threatened, right? And that's why we need to take billions of our tax dollars and give them away to Raytheon and Lockheed Martin and all of these guys who continue to make all these weapons and then we sell them all around the world, right? And South Korea is right up there with Turkey and Australia and, and it always ranks among the top three or four countries that buys weapons from the United States. And you know, in order to keep this racket going, we always need an enemy, right? Um, and and in, the, in the case of North Korea, the United States has always said North Korea is a threat to our security uh, in the region, and that's been the reason that they use to sell weapons to Japan, to Taiwan, to South Korea, right? Um, so it's no surprise the biggest challenge for permanently ending the Korean War is the what we call the military industrial complex, right? And uh, they, that interest is reflected in people like Sumi Terry. She is like the main mouthpiece of the military industrial complex on the Korea issue these days. Um, but also, 
it's reflected in both parties, in the, both the Republicans and the Democrats, right? Um, uh, they are basically um, uh, working in the interests of the military industrial complex. So then what is the path forward? What is the path forward? <laughs> oh, I hope you have the answer to that. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm sure all of us have some thoughts on this question, right? Well, let's start here. It's a kind of a, a cynical picture, but North Korea's answer was to get the bomb, right? If we use an analogy, it's like this. Let's say Bruce and I, we've had beef going back many, many years. We hate each other's guts, right? And I have a gun, and I like to point it at him and threaten him with him all the time, right? And one day, Bruce says, I'm tired of this. So he goes out and gets us his own gun. And then I look at Bruce and say, what did you do that for? Yeah. And I say to everybody, he's got a gun. He's a threat. To, he's a menace to society. Oh, this thing? I mean, I've had this forever. You know, I'm a responsible gun owner. But this guy, you cannot trust this guy. You never know what he's going to do with this, right? So the, uh, this is basically what's happening, right, between the United States and North Korea. And, you know, I'm saying to Bruce, I'm saying, put down your gun. And in this situation, North Korea is not saying, no, I love my gun. I'm going to hold on to this forever and ever. You can't make me take, take, you know, you can't take this away from me. What North Korea is saying is, Bru Bruce and, and I, or or Hyun and I, let's put down our guns together at the same time, right? So what North Korea did do uh, in May of this year, they, they blew up their nuclear test site. And uh, when Pompeo just went to Pyongyang this month, uh, Kim Jong-un said to him, uh, you can bring outside observers to come and verify that it is no longer usable. And then when Moon Jae-in was there in September, they also signed a declaration where North Korea said, we will permanently dismantle our missile test site and then also open that up to outside observers. So if you have no more nuclear test site and no more missile test site, that means you cannot test a nuclear weapon anymore. And if you cannot test, you cannot develop it. And so basically what North Korea is saying is we will freeze our nuclear weapons uh, development. What is interesting to me is that, you know, in the, in the past, uh, when there were past attempts at denuclearization, the process that Washington likes to follow is first they must declare, meaning North Korea must give them all sorts of paperwork, you know, to saying this is the extent of our nuclear program. This is where all of our different facilities are, et cetera. And then Washington would look at uh, the declaration, the report, and then they will verify to make sure that's true by putting inspectors on site and then get to the process of dismantlement. So that's been the process that had been, uh, that's the traditional process. All of the arms control people, you know, this is the process that they think about. With North Korea, we got to stage one. We never got to stage two. In 2007, North Korea did send tons and tons of boxes of paperwork to Washington and said, OK, here it is, our declaration of our nuclear program. And Washington looked at it and said, we don't believe you. So we must send inspectors to, ve to uh, verify. And, the, you know, and North Korea said, no, you cannot just come and poke around anywhere you want. In, in our country, that's, that's a, a violation of our sovereignty. We're not going to let you do that. So then the negotiations were deadlocked, and they never got anywhere. And that's sort of the, been the pattern in terms of denuclearization, uh, not, not only with North Korea, but also with Iran, with Iraq. So that's always been the, the contention. So it seems to me like what North Korea is doing now is saying, no, we're going to do, a, do this a different way. So what North Korea is doing is we're going to dismantle first, and then you can come and verify to, to make sure that our facilities are not working anymore. So 
you know, Pompeo just came back and he says that there could be another summit soon between Trump and Kim Jong-un. So probably after the midterm elections and, and before Thanksgiving, sometime in November, we could see another summit. And th this is the kind of thing that they will probably talk about um, is, you know, what, what is the process, the sequencing. Um, and uh, this could be the kind of process that we see is that North Korea says, OK, we're going to first dismantle. You send your observers to come and check to make sure that, you know, we have dismantled it. However, Getting rid of North Korea's nuclear weapons alone does not actually get us to peace. Because we have the armistice, there can also be a conventional war. And when there is a conventional war, even if the US had nothing to do with it, if there's a war between North and South Korea, the US is automatically involved. Do you know why? There's two reasons. Yeah. So number one, there is a mutual defense treaty that was signed in 1953 that says, you know, if you are attacked by another country, we will come and defend you. So after 9-11, South Korea had no choice to send troops to Iraq, to Afghanistan. And there was a big uproar about this. It was a liberal president, No Mu Hyun, and a lot of peace activists in South Korea said, we have no business going into the Middle East. What do we do? Why are we sending troops? And the, and the president said, we have no choice. We are bound by treaty, right? Same thing. If South Korea and North Korea, you know, even if there's an accident that escalates into a war because, you know, there's no peace treaty and it's an armistice situation, the United States is bound by treaty. They have to send troops. Also, as you said, who commands South Korean troops during wartime? It's the United States. So if there's a war, the US has to be automatically involved, right? So the only way that we can actually get to peace is we have to permanently settle the Korean War, right? Which means we have to turn the armistice into a peace treaty. And if you look at a lot of the you know, news media reports these days, you know, they, they make it sound like peace treaty is, is, is North Korean, you know. Only the North Koreans want peace treaty, right? But actually, that's not true. All Koreans want a peace treaty. And also, it's in the interest of the US public um, to sign a peace treaty, because you need to permanently settle it uh, in order not to get, into, get involved in an accidental, you know, escalation of an accidental war. What is a peace treaty? It is a permanent settlement of the war. And in the, case, in the case of Korea, I think there needs to be at least four, substantively, four elements to the peace treaty. One is establish normal diplomatic relations, which means uh, you know, um, establishing embassies in each other countries. And if, if embassy is too premature, maybe a, a liaison office or a, an intersection or something like that, right? Um, also, uh, lift the travel ban, um, allow um, humanitarian aid workers, Koreans who have separated family members, U.S. citizens who want to travel there and learn about North Korea, allow for free travel and also promote civilian engagement, right? So I think, um, it, I forget when it was, I think it was under George Bush Jr., um, the New York Philharmonic went to Pyongyang to perform there, right? And that was, you know, a, after that, I, I had the opportunity to go to North Korea in 2011, where North, you know, Pyongyang citizens talked about this and said, that was great. You know, we really enjoyed, you know, American symphony music. And it's a way for people to start opening their eyes culturally to, you know, to each other. Um, so uh, that's another thing. And then, of course, lift sanctions. Uh, because that is the main thing that is blocking economic cooperation between North and South Korea when they, they want to connect their railways, but they cannot do that because of the sanctions. Um, you know, I, I heard from friends who went on delegation to North Korea recently, and they said when they go to North Korea, they cannot even buy a bottle of water because it's a violation of sanctions. So they have to bring everything with them. They can't spend any South Korean dollars in, in, in North Korea. 
Um, and then there needs to be a gradual reduction and withdrawal of troops on all sides, right? Because that's the sharp settlement of war. Um, so um, many of you don't know this, but um, starting this week, I am now a full-time organizer. I have not done this in a long time. I'm a full-time organizer with a group called Women Cross DMZ. And um, Women Cross DMZ, uh, along with three other women's organizations, um, a, a coalition of South Korean women's groups, and also WILF, Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, uh, who work at the UN level, mostly, and then Nobel Women's Initiative, which is a, women, a group of women Nobel laureates. We came together and we are launching a campaign, Peace Treaty by 2020, two years. We feel that there is a small window of opportunity right now for a peace treaty because the North Korean leader wants this to happen, the South Korean leader wants this to happen, and ironically, for different reasons, the guy in the White House also wants this to happen. So these three forces are aligning, and we may not get this opportunity again. Like we have two years, basically, to push to make a peace treaty happen. Um, so that's uh, going to be our campaign for the next two years, and of course, uh, those groups alone cannot do it. The Koreans alone cannot do it. Remember the big, giant military industrial complex in Washington that we are up against, right? In order to make this happen, we actually need the support of everyone uh, to, to, to push for this to happen. So uh, I'm going to actually appeal to your, uh, for your support. But have I, before I do that, have I sold you on the need for a peace treaty? Yeah. Yes. Okay, great. So, a couple of things that you can do uh, concretely. There, will be, there is going to be a sign-on letter coming out soon. Uh, basically, it's, um, it's a letter drafted by Korean Americans as well as uh, peace groups like Peace Action uh, National, uh, like uh, AF American Friends Service Committee, um, and we are still, it's still going back and forth. People are making edits and changes and things like this, but I think it will finally be ready by next week. Um, and what we want to do is, and it's basically a statement saying we need to end the Korean War and we need to permanently settle the war through a peace treaty. Um, and we want to circulate it among many people, get many organizations to sign on. Um, and it will basically, when, when, when you do something like this, it is covered very extensively, at least by the South Korean media, uh, because you know, they like the fact that, oh, it's not just us in South Korea that want this to happen. Look, we have friends and allies who support this in the United States and Korean Americans. And, and so um, uh, that's uh, one purpose. And then also we want to use it as an educational tool um, by circulating it among our friends and allies and, uh, in this country. Uh, about the issue. The second thing that we want to do is create advocacy teams in different parts of the country. And these teams would be Korean Americans plus peace organizations to press their elected uh, representatives to come out on the support of, of peace. Um, we just created such a team in New York and it is a very dynamic team. Um, it is made up of Korean Americans and also uh, folks from uh, Peace Action New York, veterans groups, About Face, um, and also the Friends Committee on National Legislation Advocacy Team in New York. Yes, uh, we've, we've all come together and we just came up with a simple letter that says, we want you to support peace in Korea and we sent it to all of the um, congressional delegation of New York State. And we really did not think we would get any responses because usually when you send something like that by email, it just sits in their inbox. They don't really pay attention to it. They never, you never get a response, right? However, it just so happened that the day that we sent the letter was the day that Pompeo came back from Pyongyang and he, it was in the news. And so we got tons of uh, responses from different offices saying, yes, we want to learn more about this issue. You know, please, let's have a call. 
So we've now we're creating teams of uh, people to have uh, briefing calls uh, with the foreign policy pe staffers in Washington. Um, and it's interesting now, nowadays, you no longer have to go to their office and meet them in person because they all want to do it you know, online, on, on the phone or by Skype. And so then it's, it's much easier for us because we don't have to you know, get busy people to take time off their jobs and go and meet with them. It's just, no, take just 15 minutes from your lunch, lunch hour and just call them. And uh, it's been very interesting, you know, because so far, uh, Washington, you know, politicians have been very quiet on the Korea issue. I think for two main reasons. The Republicans are quiet because peace is usually not their thing. <laughs> and the Democrats are quiet because they don't want to support anything that Trump does, right? So he said, you know, how are we going to talk to them about this issue? Well, when we talk to the Democrats, we tell them, did you know all of the dramatic things that are happening between North and South Korea? And, you know, Moon Jae-in, who is the democratically, you know, 83% approval rating, democratically elected president of our ally country, is leading this process, and Korean Americans are so supportive of this. We think you should support this. And the Democrats cannot say no to this. Um, so they say, oh, yes, this sounds very important. Um, of course we support, you know, uh, inter-Korean, uh, you know, relations. And then to the Republicans we say, look at what President Trump is doing. You know, we really think this is important. We are supportive of this and you should support this too. So I think there is a way to actually engage people in both parties on this. Um, so uh, if... There also can, I mean, you know, Joe uh, already talked about an advocacy team that's already been doing something like this, right, uh, on the Korea issue. So if we can, um, you know, if there's room to expand it, get more organizations involved, that there can be a team, you know, I don't know that there are many Korean Americans in Maine, um, but uh, if there, oh, 200. Oh, yes, there you go. Okay. So if we can get Korean Americans, you know, many Korean Americans for a long time have been either very quiet about political issues, well, I mean, because of their, you know, their experience during the Korean War and the military dictatorship, so it's ingrained in our culture to stay quiet and not say much. Um, even if you have certain beliefs and thoughts, you don't say them out loud, right? So in the, among the older generation especially, that's ingrained in us, right? Um, and also, people, it depends on you know, when they came to the United States, but people who, of a certain uh, generation tend to have some conservative views, right? Um, however, right now, uh, because what Moon Jae-in is doing is so incredibly popular in South Korea, among the diaspora too, people are, paying attention, oh, what's happening here? This is very interesting. So unless they are really strongly reactionary uh, people, majority of most ordinary Korean Americans are very excited and saying, yeah, this is a good thing. Um, even my, my parents who are typical immigrants, not political at all, they never get excited about any political issue. You know, they, they said to me recently, they said, you know, when the railways are connected, we want to be the first ones in line to ride the railway from the south to the north and then go all the way to China and maybe all the way to Moscow and Europe, right? Because the railways can be all connected. So there is great excitement about this. Um, so if we can uh, create um, team, a, a team here as well who, who can uh, engage uh, the main uh, representatives on this issue. Um, we would love, I would love to work closely with you guys. And if you need a Korean voice uh, to be on the calls, I'm happy to, you know, speak. If we can organize and reach out to other Koreans who are based in Maine, that's even better. Um, but anyway, I think uh, that something like that could be very exciting. So if it's 875 people, you should at least to be able be able to find eight people. <laughs> who are willing to work with you on this. <laughs> um, so, in closing, I want to 
share with you this image. So recently, South Korean farmers said they're going to send 100 tractors to North Korea. And they said, we are sick of the sanctions against North Korea. You know, inter-Korean relations and sanctions do not go, go together. So we are going to defy the sanctions. And I love what they said. They said, let us crush the barbed wire that cuts through our peninsula with our tractors, right? So this is what they plan to do. And then the last thing that I want to show you, because this is something that we rarely get to see, is just an image of a typical Sunday afternoon in North Korea. We'll have, uh, when, we, when we sign the peace treaty by 2020, we will lift the travel ban, and then there will be a dance-off between main peace activists and the grandmas of North Korea. <laughs> All right, and that's the end of my presentation. Yeah.